There's a reason why so many people struggle with Chinese or language learning in general, and it's not because Chinese itself is hard. It's because most people aren't aware of the now heavily documented open secret of language learning, which is comprehensible input. To acquire Chinese to a decent level of fluency, you don't need textbooks. You don't need to go to class. You don't need to even get a tutor, really. You only really need to do three things. Number one, get comprehensible input. Get understandable Chinese, preferably Chinese that's also compelling or at least interesting to you, into your eyes and ears. Number two, increase your ability to get comprehensible input by mastering pronunciation, or at least the basics of pronunciation, and learning characters. You'll need about 3,000 of them if you want to get to a very high level. And finally, the third stage, output. You need to actually practice speaking and writing can help too. Now that three-step process might seem simple and it is actually very simple, but it took me personally a long time and a lot of mistakes to actually figure it out. And unfortunately, a lot of Chinese learners never figure this out because it's not mainstream. But thanks to the internet and mainly YouTube, people are finding out about this whole comprehensible input immersion thing. If you go and sign up for a public or private class for Chinese, or even if you sign up for an individual tutor online, you're probably gonna end up learning in the traditional way, which involves analyzing the language, memorizing grammar structures and vocabulary, basically treating Chinese as if it's an academic subject like a science of some kind, but it isn't. Nor can you get good at understanding or producing Chinese fluently without, well, understanding it and producing it a lot. If you do learn a language with purely textbooks and teachers and classes, what you'll inevitably end up doing is learning about Chinese. You'll end up studying linguistics as opposed to actually being able to just produce the language fluently. And I can tell you this from personal experience, okay? I went to university for just a semester in China. Phil Crimmins, Mandarin Blueprint co-founder, actually went for an entire three years to get a degree in Chinese. And once we found out about immersion and comprehensible input, and we started just watching Chinese TV and listening to Chinese podcasts a lot, and of course, reading lots of books, our skill and ability to understand and produce Chinese went through the roof and all of our classmates were kind of just stuck. In fact, I remember very clearly we'd have people coming up to us who'd been learning Chinese for four years and asking us for advice on how to learn Chinese. And they were doing this because they'd been studying it for so long and yet they still couldn't produce the language easily and fluently. It's so funny that now Phil refers to his degree certificate as his degree in de because I mean, think about it. If someone wants to know if you're good at Chinese and you want to prove it to them, you don't show them a piece of paper, right? You just open your mouth and start producing it. So now we've covered that, let's talk about what immersion actually is and how you can do immersion to get the best possible results. So one thing that we should make absolutely clear is that you do not need to go to China to immerse in Chinese. That's like the old way of thinking. Now, no matter where you are, you can access Chinese content in all different formats from the comfort of your own home or while you're on the go. And I think it's important to understand that it's not just about getting comprehensible input. We're not Johnny Five, that robot, which most people watching this probably don't even know that reference, but I'm gonna use it anyway because I loved that movie as a kid. We're not just robots and a very important, often forgotten part of this comprehensible input is that the input should also be compelling. What I consider to be real immersion is forgetting you're even learning Chinese. You're simply consuming Chinese content for the same reason that Chinese people do, for entertainment and education. Now, you won't always be able to achieve this feeling of being lost and absorbed in the content, especially if you're a lower level, but that's what you wanna aim for. So now we're clear on the actual process, what we're aiming to do, how do we actually do it, especially if you're a lower level? Well, before you start jumping into Chinese and listening to it and watching it and trying to read it, well, you need to build a foundation. We call this foundation building period with Chinese study. Yes, I know I've just spent a long time in this video criticizing studying and learning in the traditional way, but with Chinese, you don't really have a choice but to learn some things. You have to learn the characters, you have to memorize those, and you can't really learn them through osmosis very easily. You can't just acquire them just by looking at them. It's a very inefficient way to do that. You study them, you commit them to memory. I made a video right here that guides you on exactly how to memorize as many characters as you want. This method is insanely powerful and you can learn any Chinese character you want in just a few seconds. It's also a good idea to get at least a thousand words under your belt, the most common words, maybe even 1500 of them. And the reason you wanna do that first, as well as learning a bunch of characters, is that that gives you the foundation to be able to read simple sentences in Chinese. Now, it's completely possible to become fluent in Chinese or any language without reading. And in fact, most of us do become fluent 
learn before we learn how to read, right? But if you learn to read as soon as possible, right at the beginning of your journey, then that gives you a huge advantage over, say, children learning a language because reading is a far more comprehensible form of input. Think about it. If you are listening to a sentence, you just have that chance to understand it in the moment. You'll need lots of hours of listening practice before your brain is able to naturally decode what's being said, especially when we listen to rather advanced Chinese at a native speed. But with reading, you can just look at the sentence and as long as you know the characters involved and most of the words, you can pretty much figure out what's going on. Now, sometimes, of course, there'll be a grammatical structure that you're unfamiliar with, and that's actually where grammatical explanations do come in handy. They're not completely a waste of time. They can give you that jump start to be able to understand what's written in front of you. But as a general rule, you can understand reading way easier and way faster than you can with listening. So that's why it's a great place to start. So you learn those 3,000 characters and then that base vocabulary of about 1,000 words or 1,500 words, and then you can just get started immersing and this is where you're going to spend the vast majority of your time with Chinese. In fact, as long as you want to continue to improve your Chinese, you'll be doing immersion. Now after a period of immersion, maybe a few hundred hours or so, you will naturally be able to start producing Chinese at a high level. Your ability to produce the language seems to be directly correlated with how much you can understand it. That's why after a while, speaking and writing or output naturally become a part of your journey. But no matter what, Immersion always takes up the majority of your time. Now, if you compare this to traditional methods, you'll be studying from the beginning and you'll always kind of be studying throughout your entire journey. You never really stop. You're always trying to memorize new things and study new aspects of the language. Another important difference between the traditional approach and this immersion approach is that you also output from the very beginning. You're sort of pushed to speak, drill, repeat after the teacher, this sort of thing. And immersion is just kind of an incidental thing that happens as you read articles from your textbook and you listen to dialogues, but it's not a core focus of your activity. Whereas with the immersion approach, it's the complete opposite. Study is something that you have to do, but once you've got to those 3000 characters and a few words, you're kind of done with study. I guess you could kind of count reviewing flashcards that you make from your immersion content, which I'll get to later, as part of your study, but it's nowhere near as boring and difficult as the traditional way. In fact, it's super fun. And output is not forced, it comes naturally once you've had enough input. Now, if you're already at an intermediate level and you're already getting tons of immersion and you're ready to start speaking and hone that skill set, then you can go check out this video where I give you some really good tips on how to do that. But for now, let me walk you through what we consider to be the best approach to immersing in Chinese possible. Now, I've personally spent so much time immersing in different forms of Chinese media, and I've learned a lot. And I would always just choose a piece of content I liked, whether it's a TV series, a podcast, and I would just watch it and I would just play it, make flashcards out of that content. And I would try and put the audio in. What I mainly focused on was just spending time with the language and I would get a lot of passive listening done. So whilst I was doing other things, I would have Chinese playing in the background. I didn't have much of a system to it. I just wanted to make sure that I spent as much time as possible with the language. And I got amazing gains from that. I would passively listen a lot. Phil and I were both actually heavily inspired by Katsumoto of all Japanese all the time fame. I highly recommend you go check out his articles. They're incredibly informative and motivating. And we would basically just follow his advice. We would make flashcards. We would just listen at all hours of the day whenever we could. And because of these activities in a very short period of time, like a few months to a year, we felt our Chinese noticeably improve. So we're actually spending our time enjoying ourselves, having fun and consuming all sorts of interesting content while actually improving our Chinese skill without touching a textbook or going to class. It's really cool. So we kind of had our own process for doing this. But then one day I stumbled across Matt versus Japan and his Refold website. And since that time, my immersion has become far more regimented and structured. Now there's a lot to this method that I already knew and that I'd been doing for a long time, but there are also a few different aspects to it that were new to me. Specifically, the idea of recycling the same piece of content and using it in different ways. So the process goes something like this. You find a piece of content that's at or around your level. It could be slightly above your level, especially if you're a lower level, you don't have that much choice at this stage. You then consume the content in a way that Refold describes as free flow. So that you just sit there and watch the TV show, the movie, or read the book. It applies to reading too. You try and understand as much as you possibly can. You're fully focused on this content. Then you consume the same piece of content again, maybe immediately after or sometime later. And this time around, you mine the content for words, phrases, sentences that you want to learn, or as you probably say, acquire. 
You then create flashcards from these sentences with audio and preferably an image from the actual content as well, if that applies. And you finish your flashcard reviews every single day. Now, finally, this is a very important step. You then take that same piece of content and you passively listen to the audio, again, if you have audio for it, which I highly recommend you do. It's far better to focus on listening or listening and reading together than it is just purely reading. And the reason for that is reading, although it's great for building vocabulary and maybe getting a better grasp of grammar of the language, as a fuel for your fluency, it's not quite as effective as listening. If you do tons of listening, it gives you the ability to imitate the language in a way that reading just doesn't. I mean, have you ever tried to say an English word and you've said it kind of wrong or you don't really know how to stress a certain syllable or which syllable to stress? And it's because you've only read the word, you've never heard it, or at least haven't heard it enough. Well, now apply that to Chinese or any other language you're learning. It's far better to hear the real language spoken by a real native speaker than it is to just purely read it. But of course, there's nothing wrong with reading and you should read where it's appropriate or where it's not convenient to listen. For example, when I'm in bed with my family and my kids are sleeping and I wanna just read something, I wanna consume something before I go to sleep, I will read a comic or something on my phone. I won't be listening to Chinese at that point. But wherever possible, I'm reading and listening or I'm just listening. And I highly recommend you do the same. So those are the basic steps. Now let me go into each step in more detail so you know exactly how to act on this. So step one, find a piece of content at your level. And remember, if you're a lower level, just follow the phrase that my mom used to tell me a lot, beggars can't be choosers, right? So if you are not that advanced at Chinese, then you can't expect to have both compelling and comprehensible content. That's usually something that more advanced, at least intermediate learners get access to. What you wanna aim for is, can I basically understand what's going on in this piece of content? And you can increase your chances of understanding what's going on by choosing something that is reading dominant media. Something like graded readers, graded podcasts with transcripts, or TV shows, cartoons ideally, things made for children that also have subtitles. You see again why reading is so useful, especially at a lower level when you're trying to immerse. Those subtitles give you so much support and aid your listening as you're consuming the material. You can also make media that's a bit tough for you more comprehensible by not only having subtitles for it, say if it's a TV show, but also pausing it after every line to give yourself more of a chance to understand what's going on. And whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced learner, it's a good idea to first master one kind of more basic Chinese material, say for example, TV shows that are about daily life, before you start jumping into documentaries about history and architecture. Remember, the main reason you're immersing in Chinese content is to be able to speak like a Chinese person. So you wanna first focus heavily on consuming and fully comprehending content that is based on Chinese people just living their lives. So there's tons of dramas, there's lots of podcasts as well that you can listen to where people are just talking in the way that Chinese people talk. So you wanna try and stay away from the more formal media if possible until you get to that point. Now there's tons of different types of Chinese content you could consume, so let's make it a bit easier for you and take all the different types of media and divide them by difficulty. And as you can see here, the forms of media that are closer to pure reading are easier and the ones that are closer to pure listening are harder. Now the easiest for you are probably graded readers which are usually pure reading but nowadays most of them will come with audio as well. Children's novels, comic books, blog posts, literary novels are all pure reading and they very rarely come with an audio version. Once you get to around 1500 maybe a couple of thousand characters and you've got a bunch of words under your belt you will be able to move on from graded readers pretty quickly. Even the most advanced graded readers don't really go above a few hundred characters in complexity. And I think the next big step for you would be TV with subtitles. I think of all the Chinese media that exists, you'll be spending the vast majority of your time with this type of content. And there's a couple of simple reasons for that. There's tons of this type of material and there's just so much you can learn from it, especially if you use the techniques that I'm about to share with you. And I highly recommend that you choose at least two, maybe three or even four different TV shows or movies to immerse in, just so you have a bit of variety. And that's really important with this process. Then you just choose an episode and you just start consuming it, whether that's a cartoon, whether it's a graded piece of content, you consume the content. You listen to it, you watch it, or you read it. And then ideally you do it again, but this time you start making flashcards from it. And by far, my favorite flashcard setup is Magaku with Anki. So all you do is just sign up for Magaku, sign up for Anki, 
and also get a Netflix account. Uh, but you can also use it with YouTube, which is of course free, but there are also paid channels on YouTube, which you can and should pay for if you want that extra Chinese material. Then just find, say, a TV show that's in Chinese that you want to consume on Netflix. Make sure you've got Megaku installed. And as you're watching it, you can make flashcards from it with the audio from the actual TV show and a screenshot of that particular scene from that exact moment where you made the flashcard. Magaku also does lots of cool things like it allows you to speed up any space in between lines being said in the TV show up to eight times faster. You can also track the words that you know and then automatically create a bunch of flashcards from any piece of content on Netflix or YouTube that are made up of sentences that contain the words that you don't yet know or the words that you want to learn. And another cool thing it does is it downloads just the audio of individual TV shows or entire series at once. And on top of that, it cuts out any space in between. So instead of having like a 45 minute episode of a Chinese drama, it cuts out all the music and the dramatic stares and all that stuff. And you'll end up with like half the length, but it's pure dialogue. So all this stuff, by the way, before this little tool came along, used to take, I don't know, a long, long time. And you'd also have to have a ton of knowledge about these different tools and technologies and know how to use them and maybe have a Windows and not a Mac. And it's stuff that people like me just, just can't get their head around. But now anyone can do it and it's super fun and easy. That's our recommended setup for immersion, but there are countless others. If you go and research online, you'll find all sorts of elaborate setups. But I'll tell you something that Matt versus Japan shared with us in a recent interview we did with him. When we asked him all about his immersion setup and what he thinks is the best one, he made a very good point, which was a lot of people get so obsessed with figuring out the ultimate immersion setup, like making it the most efficient. So you'd have setups like using different media players and automatically creating flashcards as opposed to manually. And people get so hung up on what's the most effective method. And the best methods for making flashcards are the ones where you actually spend a little bit of time and energy and effort and focus on each individual one. So for example, going to sleep and just programming your computer to make thousands of flashcards from all of this material, it sounds really cool and it might work for some people, but we think that it's better to actually make flashcards individually, manually. But whatever you decide to do, however you decide to do it, you make those flashcards, they've got to have audio at least and preferably an image as well. And then you start building what we like to call a passive playlist. And then you just make sure wherever you go, wherever you can, you play this material passively while you're working out, you're traveling, while you're working, while you're doing other things. Don't get fired though, obviously. And you'll get so much more from that passive listening activity instead of just listening to it passively immediately without doing those first two steps. But once you get to a more advanced level, the free flow and what Refold call the intensive immersion, the making flashcards part, become one and the same activity. So you'll just put on a new piece of content and you won't need to watch it a whole time first to familiarize yourself with the content and then make flashcards out of it. And then once you've consumed it that one time, you can move it straight to your passive playlist. And one thing I wanna say about this process before we move on is that I personally love it. I think it's really effective, but it doesn't mean that you have to do it and it's not set in stone. So for example, I myself do not follow this rule in like a regimented fashion at all. In fact, for me, I spend most of my time immersing passively. That's how I get most of my immersion done and then when I can I'll focus on a TV show and I will make flashcards out of it and sometimes let's be honest most of the time I forget to export the audio and listen to it passively because I'm at such an advanced level I have kind of two separate things I like to watch TV and just absorb the content sometimes just purely free flow and I never intensively immerse it then when I'm out and about doing things, I listen passively, sure, to some of the material that I've downloaded, but most of my passive time is spent listening to podcasts that I like in Chinese. Now, because of my high level, I'm able to do that, but this flow is far more applicable to someone who is a beginner, intermediate, and you wanna push through that intermediate stage into more advanced fluency and comprehension. So if you follow the recommended setup that I mentioned earlier with Megaku and Anki and Netflix slash YouTube, steps three and four are kind of one and the same activity. They happen at the same time. Now, in terms of what to actually mine, how to decide whether, yes, I want to save this sentence to my flashcards. Well, well, this is actually a personal preference thing, and it depends on how many flashcards you want to take on, because if you're at a lower level, then there'll be tons that you don't understand. So you have to kind of develop this instinct for what words are worth your time 
and what words aren't right now. So for example, at my level, I'm really trying to push through to more advanced stages and the law of diminishing returns kicks in. That's harder and harder to do as you get better and better, right? So when I immerse in content, every single word that comes up or phrase or cheng yu idiom that I don't know, I hit save and I'm going to save that. I'm going to be brutal. I'm going to give myself tons of flashcards from each content. I'm going to extract every piece of goodness from that Chinese material that I possibly can. On the other hand, if you're more of a beginner slash intermediate, you might not want to just save every single thing that comes up. You could maybe use a technique that John Fotheringham mentioned in our interview with him, which you'll find for free in our interview series, Legends of Language Learning, link in description. He mentioned the rule of five. So when he sees or hears a word, five times, then on the fifth time, he'll be like, okay, I'm gonna save that word and I'm going to put an effort towards learning it. So you could try that too, especially if you feel like a bit bombarded with stuff you don't understand. And that makes total sense, right? Because if things come up more often, then they are more common. And if they're more common, they're more useful for you. But on the other hand, just remember that everything I'm sharing with you today is not written in stone and there's a lot of flexibility. Just follow what you like. Just follow your instincts, feel like what is more enjoyable to you. If you want to learn what Matt versus Japan describes as a juicy word, even if your instinct tells you that it's probably not that common, if you really want to learn it, it'll be fun for you to learn it. Go ahead and save that and review it. Remember, the key thing here is to enjoy yourself. This is the cardinal rule of immersion. If you are bored or frustrated for any length of time that's unreasonable, you need to switch things up. We're playing the long game here. So if you're trying to enjoy a piece of content and you don't know a word and that's stopping you from comprehending what's going on and therefore affecting your enjoyment of the material, go ahead and save that word as well. It's also very commonly recommended that when people go to save a sentence to make sure there's only one thing in that sentence, one word, one character that they don't know and don't save it if it's got multiple things, Eh, we don't really mind. I think that you should just save it if you want to. And you can always just send the flashcard to your future self if you feel like it's too difficult. Now, in terms of creating flashcards, step four in this process, you can't always use Magaku, right? So there'll be a lot of TV shows, for example, in Chinese that are only available on ITE or IQ.com. And they're not available on Netflix or even YouTube. But I will say that often it will seem like they're not available, but you can just go to their YouTube channel, like ITE's YouTube channel, for example, or Tencent's YouTube channel, and you should be able to locate most of the episodes in there, but they must have subtitles attached too, and that's not always a possibility either. So if you can't use Magaku, what can you do to make sentence flashcards? And the answer is you spend quite a bit of extra time but this will often be worth it for you. You can use an app like ShareX for Windows or OWL OCR if you have a Mac, and you can use these to create audio recordings of the material as well as take screenshots. And then you just manually make your flashcards that way. Magaku might take two to three seconds. This process might take 30 seconds per flashcard once you get into the groove of it. If you're reading comics and you wanna create a flashcard out of it, you can use an OCR reader if you're reading a physical comic book or if you're reading comics using a comic book app, which I always do, I never read real comics. And you can take screenshots on your phone or iPad and, and then import them into your flashcard software and just look at them, just review them on your flashcards in that way. If you're using video games, you can use the exact same thing. There are a few different apps and tools for making flashcards out of video games that I don't know how to use, but I just find OWL OCR is really effective on Mac, and I'm sure you could do the same thing with ShareX. And when it comes to listening apps, like my favorite one, for example, is Simalaya FM, the podcast app. There's a couple of cool things you can do with that. For example, you can highlight the AI transcript, which are very accurate and then you can export that as a little video which comes with audio. And you can actually just copy and paste that little video that you export into your flashcards. This whole process probably takes around 60 seconds per export. So it's much more time intensive, but it could be worth it if you're really interested in the material. So if you've been listening to this so far and you're really excited about getting into immersion, getting started, but maybe your level's not quite high enough to do so yet, and that's frustrating, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our course, The Mandarin Blueprint Method, which I think could really help you out. So the hardest part, without a doubt, about acquiring Chinese to a very high level is not the immersion. It's getting started. It's that study section of your language acquisition journey. 
which is much bigger for Chinese than it is other languages because you have to learn all those characters. You have to get that base understanding. So Phil and I both spent years creating a unique patent pending curriculum designed to get you from where you are now to any level of comprehension of Chinese you want. Now for 99.9% .9 of learners, this stage is really boring and frustrating. Learning all those characters, that base vocabulary, starting to do graded reading. It's a very painful long process, but we've made it a simple and efficient one. So the course gets you all the way to 3,050 characters very quickly in just a couple of hundred hours. And along the way, you unlock more and more complex, comprehensible input in the form of individual sentences at first, and then longer form content like dialogues and articles, and then eventually entire stories in Chinese, all of which you can comprehend very quickly and easily. So if you'd like to get through that really long and often boring study stage of Chinese really quickly while actually enjoying yourself, go and check out the link in the description to learn more. Now, in terms of how using the Mandarin Blueprint method relates directly to immersion, it does kind of change your path quite significantly. So for example, without the Mandarin Blueprint method, you have to learn a bunch of characters and then learn a bunch of words and they're kind of out of sync with each other. And then you have to just sort of fumble your way through to reading and understanding sentences at some point and then forcing yourself to understand Chinese content, native Chinese content, through just exposure, exposure, exposure. And you also have to kind of start immersing very early. That's actually the best way for you to acquire new words and grammar structures, just getting it straight from real Chinese content. But it's a challenge, especially if you're just starting out. Whereas if you have the Mandarin Blueprint method, we provide comprehensible sentences, 15,000 of them, as you progress through different levels of the course. Until you get a huge chunk of the way through our course, or even right to the end of the course, you don't really need to worry about immersion as much. It's just something you do sort of for fun. But because we also teach you almost 12,000 words, all with individual comprehensible and compelling sentences, as well as a bunch of graded reading content, you don't really need to save every word you see from the content you're consuming. That's just something for you to think about if you want to simplify this process as much as possible. All right, so now that you know how to immerse in Chinese effectively, I'd like to just give you some final words of advice, some wisdom that Phil and I have gained over thousands of hours of consuming Chinese material. So my first piece of advice for you is to focus on who you wish to become not what you wish to achieve. So I got this piece of advice straight out of Atomic Habits by James Clear, and it was kind of mind-blowing for me at first because it's so obvious when you think about it, but most people don't create habits like this. So most people say, I want to lose 50 pounds, or I want to learn a thousand Chinese words, or I want to watch, I don't know, an entire series in Chinese, or I want to have a Chinese conversation. But the thing is, once you achieve that goal, you kind of lose your way, right? Because, okay, now I've lost my 50 pounds, okay, I guess, I'll just get fat again. I don't know what to do because you didn't change the way you live your life based on who you wish to become. But there's a better way to do it, which is to focus on a person you wish to be. So instead of saying, I want to lose 50 pounds, you say, I am an athlete. So what does an athlete do? Well, an athlete goes to the gym every day. An athlete works on their muscles. An athlete runs several times a week. Same with Chinese. You're not trying to learn Chinese. You are a Chinese learner. You are a Chinese enthusiast, or my personal favorite, fanatic. So you're trying to become that person. And every time you show up and watch a Chinese TV show, or you review a flashcard that you've created, or whilst you're out walking your dogs, instead of listening to your favorite English podcast, you listen to a Chinese podcast. And every time you perform this behavior, you are casting a vote for that new person you want to become, that Chinese fanatic. And the reason why this is perhaps my most important piece of advice for you is that if you don't see yourself as this person, or at least trying to become this new type of person, this Chinese fanatic, it's gonna to be tough to keep the habit. And eventually, you will just show up to consume Chinese every single day because it is a part of your identity. It's part of who you are. And that's what's gonna keep you immersing in Chinese long enough to become really good at it. My next tip is to set a budget. So every single month, you can set aside a small amount of money to go towards your Chinese study. That could be $10, it could be $100 or more. And no matter what, that money is spent on Chinese in some form. Basically, you set aside this fund that will keep growing every single month. And eventually, maybe you can invest in a pair of really high quality noise canceling earphones, or you can pay for a bunch of online sessions with a tutor on italki. A really common question people ask us is, when do I start outputting? When do I start speaking? 
Well, the short answer is when you feel like it, when you feel comfortable. So many different polyglots and language experts out there recommend speak from day one, and that's absolutely fine with me. A lot of people following Stephen Krashen's work very closely will recommend that you get to more of a B2 level kind of understanding of the language first, and then start honing your speaking. For me, I like the idea of just speaking what you can, when you can, and when you feel like it. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to the cardinal rule, have fun. Does speaking stress you out? Then do not force yourself to go and speak right now. Are you a super extrovert and you have to speak to people? In fact, that's your favorite thing about learning Chinese is connecting with Chinese people. Then go and give someone a call on Tandem or HelloTalk or italki. And when it comes to finding more time to immerse in Chinese, there's a few cool things you can do. So time boxing is really useful. It's a technique that is proven to be very effective now for getting things done. So if you have a super busy schedule, just set aside a, a period of time. I think the average time is 25 minutes. That's like the optimal time with five minutes of rest, but it can be any combination. It could be 10 minutes of immersion with two minutes of rest. No need to be too regimented about it. It's just a technique for controlling the time that you do have better. Make sure you also do your high value tasks first. So you get your flashcards done as early as possible during the day, that's ideal. And then you can spend the rest of your day doing more relaxed tasks like immersing in Chinese TV shows. And finally, when it comes to managing your time, I think one of the most effective things you can do is just find the gaps throughout each day. Make Chinese within reach at all times, which for all of us, it is pretty much now, right? So put Chinese on your phone, have apps available on the first page of your phone. So there's lots of cues for you to start learning. And then whenever you have a spare two minutes or five minutes, just put something on, consume something. You'd be very surprised to find how much extra time you get for immersion throughout each day. Even if you think you're super busy, if you are just sort of present in the moment. So if I'm on the way to meet a friend or something like that, or I'm going to the gym or I'm at the gym working out, I'm gonna use all that time as much as I can to immerse in Chinese. And just one more thing on this subject based on something I learned from all Japanese all the time, another Katsumoto idea, which is to keep the water boiling. It's far better to spread Chinese a little bit out throughout your day than it is to say, immerse really heavily for like one or two hours in the morning. I don't know why this works better. I think it just does. I think it just shows your brain that this is relevant. When it's throughout each day and it's little and often, it kind of tells your brain, hey, this is important. We need to focus on consuming and actually acquiring this language. Another tip for you is a really simple phrase that I got from Refold as well, which is tolerate ambiguity. There's gonna be a lot of time when you're immersing, especially in the early days, when you don't understand what's going on and you might feel deflated by that, okay? Especially if you think you've put in a ton of work and you're not getting the results, you're not understanding enough or what you should understand. Your brain needs time to get used to the language. And I can now, even at my level, I can put on a piece of material that's about a topic that I'm maybe not that interested in or it's something that I need a bit of a foundational understanding before I can consume it such as something about chemistry or whatever, I'll put that on and I won't understand what the heck they're talking about and I'll feel deflated. But it's silly to feel that way because you just need to give your brain time and you can't expect to understand something that's above your level immediately. My next tip is to be patient and play the long game. So it's gonna take at least a thousand hours of active study, like time spent, focus 100% on Chinese. If you wanna get from zero to say B2 fluency or a solid level of fluency and understanding of the language. Now there are of course other factors at play, but generally I think you can do it in a thousand hours or less. Might take a few hundred hours extra for certain people. But a thousand hours is really not that overwhelming if you think about what you're getting for that thousand hours. You're getting competency, proficiency in one of the quote unquote hardest languages in the world. It's not really the hardest, it's just the longest. It all comes down to habit. How much time can you invest daily? So if you can put in just one hour a day, then a thousand hours, I mean, it's going to take you less than three years to get to a really solid level of Chinese. But if you really work hard at adding passive listening and filling those gaps within your day, you could easily shave a year off of that time. So it's nice to have a goal and say, I want to get to X level of fluency in X amount of time, but it's not really relevant. What's relevant is what you do each day. You have to show up and make sure you build processes in your life that keep you showing up and enjoying consuming Chinese content. As long as you try to show up every single day and put some time in consistently and you follow the methods that I've laid out for you today, you will inevitably succeed at this. 
So I think the big takeaway from all of this is the most important thing is not your immersion setup or watching a specific TV show that's awesome or even buying one of our courses. The most important thing you can do is show up every day consistently. And if you'd like to learn how to do that, I made this awesome video which guides you through that step by step.